Because the gospel that Jesus has died, is raised, is ascended, is coming, is made real to me because of the people that are part of his body that are in the room that persuade me of this. They're not persuading me of an abstraction. They are the gospel. They are Jesus to me. I can believe in the Jesus of the gospel because I believe in Jamie Ivey. Kurt Thompson, welcome back to the happy hour. <laughs> Jamie, I mean, I am so, like, I can, you, I, it, there couldn't be a better name. I'm because I'm so happy to be with you. It's just, it's, it's really, it's just a delight to be in the room together. Thank you. Thank I'm you so for happy to be me. with you. Yeah. I want to, I want to start the show by saying this, and this is going to make you mad, but I'm going to do it anyways, okay. is over the course of my, of my career, yeah. I have gotten to interview a lot of great, great people. And so mm -hmm. there are a lot of people's like that I know that I can't believe. Like sometimes I'm like, I can't believe that like Christine Kane is my friend, right? Mm -hmm. Like I can't mm -hmm. believe that mm -hmm. Ann Voskamp, you know, New York times bestseller is my friend, mm -hmm. but I want to tell you this. Mm -hmm. That there are some situations where I say, and I kind of hold it, and I can kind of feel it out, and I'm talking to someone, and then I'll say, do you know who Dr. Kurt Thompson is? And they're like, oh, my gosh, I love him. Hmm. And I say, full of sinful pride, <laughs> full of just <laughs> let me make myself bigger in the moment, I say, well, he's my friend. <laughs> and like, like, and then I say this, I say, and I, I've been to Mexico with him. <laughs> <laughs> and then they're like, what? Mm -hmm. And my most favorite moments are if I'm at a conference and someone uses your name on a screen, I literally say to the person next to me, I know him. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want you to know that, like, I throw your mm -hmm. name around like mm -hmm. I know Dr. Thompson. So okay, 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 yeah. okay, 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 okay. So I'm so I, I I'm just going to. Uh, I want, to, I want to respond by saying um, uh, it it is such it is such a meaningful thing. Like I can't like uh, I I want you to believe this that 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 you that that I would matter to you is uh, like you just can't put a price tag on that. Mm. And I'm. Uh, I, I'm just, uh, sitting here really touched by, uh, by that. So thank you. Well, I'm, I'm just saying you are one of the greatest gifts in the last couple of years to my life. Mm. And mm. my whole, our whole group that we're a part of is one of my greatest gifts, mm. but you've really been a great gift for me. Mm. And, um, just really showed me that it's okay to go to the deep, dark places, mm. Um, mm. and they mm. might be scary, mm. but that there is fruit on the other side of that. And that mm. is something I couldn't have believed, you know, four years ago. Mm. And so I'm grateful for that. <clears throat> mm. And I'm grateful for you. Mm. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's, let's, you are Dr. Kurt Thompson. You've written a, a lot of books that I think people should all go and get. They have been a blessing in my life. Um, but tell us a little bit about you. You have hmm. children and a wife and hmm. a family. Hmm. And hmm. tell us about yeah. Kurt Thompson. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, let's see. Uh, in, uh, things that are important uh, for me. I, I I'm the youngest of four sons. I had these three much older brothers. My parents in their mid forties when I was born. And so there's a whole story behind that that was really that formed me. I grew up in a town of 800 people in eastern Ohio. No stoplights. Dogs were not on leashes. Uh, that in of itself can tell people a lot. And, and that was really formational for me. I grew up in an evangelical Quaker community. That was formational for me. That was a big deal. Um, I've been married for almost 37 years to Phyllis, who just retired uh, after a long career in social work. Most recently, in the last couple of decades, has been in the public school system here in Arlington County, Virginia. And uh, no relationship has been more deeply formative for me than my than my marriage. And I'm just, you know, every, every week that passes, I, you know, it's like looking in the rearview mirror and you see more and more and more of 
uh, Providence's work at the beginning. Although, you know, you have rough spots, you have, you have spots mm-hmm. and you, you like, I mean, I, I don't know anybody who's married who doesn't have to work at it. Like the, you yeah. gotta, you, you got, you just, you, you just do like, it's, you got, you got to go, you're going onto the playing field, you're, right? Which is then why I've got to have a gym where I go do my practice so I can go onto the playing field. And so I got yep. these, this group of, these group of men that I meet every Tuesday morning for the last 25 years for confession and prayer without whom I'm a dead man and whom, mm. you know, if you don't have those guys, I don't know what my marriage would look like. So it's, I go to the gym so I can go onto the playing field. And, um, and so that's been a beautiful, uh, thing for me. Um, I, I, I and I have a, a daughter who's 33, who she turns 33 tomorrow. She, uh, is a pastor, solo pastor of a Presbyterian church in Nashville, married to a guy in Noah in his fourth year of medical school. Um, and our son, Nathan, who just turned 30 is, uh, wrapping up a PhD program. He lives here in Arlington. We get to see him quite a bit. I, I, it, it is true that I, I have, uh, and like the group that I get to meet with, with you all, like I, I have uh, an exorbitant uh, uh, treasure trove of friendships that I do not deserve. I don't deserve my life. And, uh, and, and, and people who, uh, you know, I, I believe them when they claim that they love me. Like I, I, I believe, I believe them. I like that. I, I believe that they are telling the truth. And I like I have I have this part of me that I'm that I've been working on. I got to work on that has that you know because of my own story and vulnerabilities and woundings and so forth and my own behaviors that, that doesn't believe I'm very wantable. Which is there's a mm. piece in the book that I write about this and that part of me that believes I'm not wantable makes you know it, it's uh, I am resistant to people coming to find me, uh, be, I, I'm not, not all of me is resistant, but there's a part of me that mm-hmm. is because there's the, you know, there's the worry that, well, at some point, of course, you're going to f- walk into the room where you're like, like, no, 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 no. Mm-hmm. And leave. Mm-hmm. And so, but, but we're working on that. We're, we're working on that part and, and being part of this group with you all is like, is no small part of that. Um, mm-hmm. uh, to allow for, People to say no, come. We we want you to be mm-hmm. to be part. Like it's yeah. that's, it's, that's so. Like what I said earlier about what you said. Like it's not. It's it's, it's yeah. I'm I, I am a professional sinner, um, and and, <laughs> and, I, and I am like I don't I, I don't go halfway, uh, and I'm in recovery. I, I'm in recovery for you know for being that, um, and I uh, can't believe I get paid to do what I do in working with patients as a psychiatrist, um. Uh, and, and the work that has been been put before me in the last, especially the last 15 to 20 years, um, uh, that's kind of long winded, but that's, that's, that, that's yeah. you. It's, yeah. That's Kurt Thompson. I love it. Well, Dr. Thompson, you have a new book coming out um, this, this month, actually, just in a week, and it's called The, the Deepest Place. Hmm. And it's about suffering and hope. And when I think of stuff, when I, when I personally think of suffering and hope, I think that suffering is universal. Like there's just no one that is going to get through this life without it. Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody, Mm -hmm. the person who has all the money, the person who has all the love, the person who has all the giftings and education, everybody will suffer. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's Mm -hmm. a universal thing that we can all understand. But on the flip side of that, that is hope. And I would like to make a statement saying that everyone probably will experience hope in their lifetime. I'm just, I, I don't have any thing to back that up. I would hope that would be true, but I think hope is harder to find sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so I think I want to start this conversation with you of how do you define suffering and how do you define hope? Because I think that's going to set the stage for where we go. So it's absolutely true that everybody suffers. It's equally true that most of us aren't aware of where and how we suffer, because if you're in the West, most people, not all, uh, there are many for whom this is not true. Uh, we have uh, an extraordinary array of um, uh, things that can distract me from my suffering. And so I, yeah. I, just, I just layer them on. So I'm not even aware of that. But if I were to be aware of it, uh, we would say that uh, the difference between you know, that pain is any emotional or physical stimulus that is noxious, right? That, that is unpleasant in some way, shape or form, whether it's a paper cut or it's, uh, you know, a, a perforated appendix or it's cancer, 
or it's a history of sexual abuse, uh, or it's your marriage that is falling apart, or it's your daughter or son that has a, you know, a, a terminal illness, or they've got a drug addiction, or you, you can't get a job. I mean, it's, the, the list is endless. Yeah. Uh-huh. Pa- it's pain. There is a pa- emotional, physical pain. Suffering is pain over time. Suffering has everything to do with the degree to which I experience pain over time and my response to the pain. Okay. We like to say, you know, when we're talking about this in medical circles and, uh, and in psychiatry, we say that pain is what happens to us. Suffering is my response to that pain. Okay. So suffering, hey. suffering, hence uh, as, and we talk a little bit about this in the book, hence suffering, um, uh, I can contribute to my own suffering and I largely often do without even being aware that that's what's happening, which is a large wow. part of what we go after in this piece. Yeah. Okay. So then what is hope? So the first thing we, is it the flip side? Is it the flip side of it or? Well, it's, it's related in that it has, it's related in that it's, it's got something to do with time in that, like when I think of hope, uh, I, I, we're really talking about my anticipation of something in the future. If I, you know, if, if I hope that my car starts, it's going to start in uh-huh. five minutes. It, it's, it's five minutes from now. If I hope that we get to go to, you know, uh, Florida in a week, which I'm which hoping, you know, I, right, right. But I'm, I'm hoping that I get to do this, but it's a future state thing. Like I'm anticipating something in the future. If I'm right here with you, I don't hope that I'm going to get to talk to Jamie. I'm because talking with are. you. Cause right. Okay. I'm talking with you. If I, but I'm hoping that I get to talk to you again next week because mm-hmm. it has to do with the future. And this is an important thing because we humans, like our life is time bound in ways that no other animal is, which is why we, you know, when we talk about animals suffering, um, we're probably, uh, we probably are misunderstanding the neurophysiology and, and the actual physics of what's happening in the moment. Might they be in pain? Right. Suffering perhaps, but like, I can guarantee you that if a deer gets hit on the side of the road and it's not dead yet, and we say, oh, the animal is suffering, put it out of its misery. I got to tell you, the deer is not wondering to itself, how much longer is this going to be happening to me? Right. You with me? Yes, because that's what sets us, we're set apart that way. Right. So it's not thinking about, like, it's in pain. We project that the animal is suffering. And fair enough. I mean, like, we're not we're not here to debate that. I'm not, I'm not saying yeah, that. Totally. But, 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 the, but the reason that this is important is because so much of our suffering has to do with how we construct the future in the stories that we tell about it. Hmm. So my suffering today is is my response to my pain, mm-hmm. and the way that I tell a story about that suffering thinks how I tell a story about my future. Right, because like if I'm if I'm having if I'm having a migraine headache, and I know that this migraine is going to be over in ten minutes, my experience of suffering is categorically different than if I I do not know when this thing is going to be done. Yeah. A significant part of how I suffer with my migraine is not just about the pain. It is about how I am imagining how long is this thing going to last. Mm. And so this is and, and so hope is kind of cut from the same bolt of cloth. I hope for the future. But my future, this is okay, this this is where why the subtitle is the formation of hope. We imagine hope like it's something that's gonna like drop into my lap. It's a thing that I'm either going to have or not have. Can I can I get me some hope someplace? Can I find me some hope? But it's not something that I either have or I don't have. It is a thing that I form, and it happens for this reason. Our future, uh-huh. what I imagine my future to be, is something that I am creating in my mind based on my past experiences. Okay. Okay, so stay with me here. I'm here. Right. We always, we talk about in the first book that I wrote, we talk, uh, there's a chapter that I write when, when we talk about memory, we talk about remembering our future. There's nothing that we anticipate about my future 
whether it's I anticipate getting up when we're done and walking out my office door and walking down the hallway, I'm anticipating that the floor is going to hold. It's not going to give way. Why is that? Why is that? Because I've had lots of practice of my floor. Like if my floor were to give way like that, that would be shocking. But I'm anticipating it, not because I'm just making it up out of the blue. I'm making it up because I've had lots of practice in the in the past. If I have a story that is one of unresolved trauma Mm -hmm. where my what what, where what happened to me as a teenager when i was sexually abused as a teenager if that has not been resolved all the things that i've paid attention to that i think about that i that i embed in the neural networks of my remembering brain become the hard deck from which i anticipate my future yep we don't anticipate anything in the future that we haven't already experienced Say that one more time. We don't anticipate anything in the future that we haven't already experienced. Okay. I want to ask you a question about that. Yeah. You know me and I anticipate a lot of, like, I'm like always thinking the worst is ahead. Yeah. And And are you saying that comes because I have experienced hard things? Yeah, when we because because like you're you you and you 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 anticipate like the worst things because you're not stupid. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, this is you, right. Okay, you're you're not you're not you're not just being a pansy. You're not just being weak. You're not being a coward. Like you have experience, and so when we talk about the future, we mainly we mostly talk about like that human beings when we anticipate the future. Uh, am I going to have a job? Is am I going to keep my house? Am, am I going to get cancer? All these things. I construct the future in terms of events. Right? I think about events that are going to happen. Right. I think about like I think oh I'm looking forward to being with the group next week. Mm-hmm. But what is my brain mostly looking forward to? I'm looking forward to the emotional felt sense of what it's going to be like to be in the presence of people who love me and who I love. It's this that I feel that I'm anticipating. I'm not just anticipating an event. What my brain is mostly anticipating is the emotional tenor of the event that I'm going to enter into. Yeah. And if I've had experiences in the past of... Uh, being being afraid mm-hmm. in, in in circumstances in which my fear was not resolved. Rather, I just had to bury it. I just had to white knuckle mm-hmm. it. Or if I was embarrassed or if I was disappointed or if I was really hurt or betrayed or all of those emotional states that are not very pleasant. If I haven't had a way for someone to come in and help me regulate that. What I remember is that disappointment cannot be regulated. It just must be endured. Mm-hmm. This is what my brain is taking in. And so when I anticipate the future in which I'm thinking about the worst case scenario, I am trying to anticipate it in order to do whatever I can to protect against it. Because it's not just the event I'm anticipating. It's I'm anticipating finding myself in a space in which I'm going to be overwhelmed with the feeling of being a disappointment and there will be no way out of that. Yeah. And the only way that changes is if I begin right now to enter into and to excavate the parts of my story where that disappointment or shame or sadness or whatever it is that has taken up residence within me about who I believe I am. I am sadness. I am a disappointment until and or less that is uh, until I have an experience with another human being while I'm having this experience who looks me in the eye and I have a different feeling while I'm feeling sad. When I look, oh, I'm in the room with Jamie and I, and I'm not feeling very wantable and you look at me with kindness, that very experience literally changes the neural firing pattern of my history of sadness and gives me a different experience of what it means to be sad, mm. which means, oh my goodness, if I have enough of those kinds of experiences, I begin to anticipate something very different in the future when it comes to experiencing sadness. Which you begin to hope for something different? Exactly. That's what hope is. This is why we say that hope is something that we form. This is why, like, the hope of the new heaven and earth is not just 
this theological construct. It is when Paul writes about this, he's writing on it, having had an encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, having had an encounter into the third heaven that he writes about in whatever that whatever Galatians or wherever he writes, where he writes Second Corinthians, where he writes about this, this whole notion of having real episodic embodied relational encounters with people in the middle of our pain is what mitigates our suffering. It does not eliminate it because the other part that we talk about in the book is that part of suffering also includes the very process of coming into the light. The very process of having to take off the clothing of my old self and my addictions and my impulses and my all the things that I've used to cope with yeah. this. And that's a painful process. And I wish that I didn't have to do that. But in the process of doing all this, in the context of a vulnerable community, we get the opportunity to create hope. We form it solidly. And therefore, like, I don't form hope for me. We form hope for me. We form hope for you. Mm. This is what the this is the New Testament's way of thinking about how we are doing anything. Well, we're doing it in the context of a community. Wow. There's one of my favorite verses and I I think that you got a lot from this in this book was from Paul's talking in Romans chapter 5, I believe. 5 through 8 or 3 through 5, something like that. Well, yeah, I mean, uh-huh. Yep. Where he says uh, we rejoice. Not only do we rejoice in that, which he had previously said, we glory. rejoice in our suffering. We, okay. Not only do we rejoice in the glory, but we rejoice in our suffering, which leads to endurance, which endurance leads to character, perseverance, perseverance to character, and character leads to a hope, which cannot be put to shame. Right. right. Is this where this came from for you? The suffering yeah. to hope? Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is, I mean, this is the, I mean, the, the book is really, uh, it's, it's kind of a, it's an exploration of those first five verses of Romans five and that particular verse three, that progression of suffering. Uh, the, the thing I invite the readers to look at is that, 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 that whole notion of suffering, perseverance, character, hope begins prior to that progression. It begins with this whole notion of glory mm. and what we mean by that, what Paul's referring to by that, which, and, and glory has its own, notion the, the glory that we read about in john's gospel for example that jesus talks about and the writer talks about is a particular aspect of glory that is very that that is different than it's 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 an element of glory that is not what we're typically used to talking about when we talk about when we read about it in the psalms when we read about it in the prophets it's the glory that lewis writes about in his sermon the weight of glory this whole notion that when jesus in john's gospel is talking about glorify your son as the son has glorified you, O father. It's not just this abstract idea. It's this, I, it's, it's th this abstract notion of glory of like, oh my gosh, God is so wonderful. God is so lovely. All that. It's this notion of, when I, I love how Lewis points this out. He says that an animal, a, a dog, for instance, has no greater glory, no greater joy, no greater delight than to realize his master's delight in him. Like, when is a dog ever happier? Like, a dog can, it can be happy for a lot of reasons, but like, it's never happier than it's when, like, do you have a dog? I have two dogs and right. you're, you're spot on. Right. Yep. So like, when, when you are loving on your dogs, your dogs oh, are like, the best. That's, that's all they, that's all they need. They, well, they, they're, they glory in your pleasure in them. Uh -huh. And this is what Lewis is getting at, that like we are our glory and the glory of God, the father as lavished on Jesus is God's utter pleasure in Jesus mm -hmm. and Jesus pleasure in the father. And thereby, this is how he obeys, even in the face of pain of crucifixion. It doesn't make it easy, but it becomes the hard deck on which we begin to enter into suffering. It, it, it'd be like, oh, I can suffer because we begin with glory. Mm. We begin with this sense of like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I get to be in the room with you. Yeah. You know, so like I, like, it, 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 you know, like I tell you, like, I, look, I don't, I said this, I don't deserve my life. I will tell people, no, guess who I was on a podcast with Thursday morning? Guess who I was recording with? That's right, Jamie, I, like, that's right, she's my friend. 
Right? Like, it's this sense of, like, I can't believe that Jamie Ivey wants to have me on her show. Like, I just, this is just so, and, and there, and we underestimate the uh, necessity of that relational payload being in our life. Mm. Our being able to be aware of God's pleasure mm. in us. And the way that we most powerfully uh, appropriate that and experience that and practice that is in community with the body of Jesus. And it is in that glory that we then begin to, that when, that when pain comes and it doesn't stop and it becomes suffering because we don't see an end to it. Mm -hmm. um, we are then invited to uh, allow ourselves to be in that space, in the presence of others who are saying, this is really hard. Mm -hmm. This is really hard. Uh, there's a lot that we can learn from Job's friends of what not to do when it comes to suffering. Um, suffering doesn't have answers. Mm -hmm. Suffering doesn't have explanations. Suffering uh, asks for presence. Mm -hmm. And suffering asks for presence that does not expect the one who suffers to, uh, you know, have everything figured out or be okay with it. I was talking with a friend of mine uh, last week who, whose mother uh, passed away uh, two weeks prior and uh, she died after a long battle with cancer. And the last you know few weeks were not very pleasant for her. And my friend was, you know, this person who's deeply committed to Jesus and, but found himself experiencing like a certain uh, shaking of his faith as he watched her suffer. Mm. And, you know, his sense of like, th th like, this is not fair. This is not right. And like th that she should suffer. And I asked him the question, I, and his mother was a person of deep committed faith. And I said, well, wait a minute. Um, if was, was she telling you that she didn't think this was fair? He's like, well, no. I said, was she telling, was she complaining that God was giving her a raw deal? Now that you mention it, no. So whose suffering are we actually talking about here? Mm. Right. It becomes pretty clear pretty quickly that it, it's not really my, my friend. His complaint is not about what's happening to his mom. His complaint is about what's happening to him. His suffering in watching this happen. Mm -hmm. But this is, this is an example of what I mean, Jamie, when I say um, many of us like aren't aware that it's, that it's really us. Like my mm -hmm. friend wasn't aware that like, Oh, I'm the one, this is grief for me. But, right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And what is that like? Like, yeah. And I'm by myself with these thoughts and these, right. And the moment that we started to talk about this in such a way that he starts to sense that, Oh, uh, it's my suffering. When we enter into other people's suffering in such a way that we can say, this is really hard. I don't have an explanation, but what I do know is that I'm not leaving the room. Mm. That becomes the game changer because this is, this is the arc of scripture. I am with you. I am with you. I am with you. I am with you. We, uh, yeah, this, this kind of, I think, I think this, this kind of, um, lets a little the cat out of the bag about what we're going to do next week, but um, what we see that begins to happen in John 11, the second half of the chapter with Jesus and Mary at Lazarus' death, at the notion of his death, this notion of being with, being with, and allowing that to have the amount of time that it takes to do the work that God does. Because uh, we we often are not aware that so much of how I am responding to my pain um, is a revealing of my old unfinished business, my own wounds that are not healed, uh, my own underdevelopment that God is trying to move forward that is as much a part of what suffering is doing as anything. I have seen this to be true in my own life. Like it's making me teary eyed a little bit just to see that, that, um, 
how I have taken old wounds and projected them towards my future because yeah. I haven't dealt with them. Yeah. And it changes the suffering and it diminishes the amount of hope I can have because I'm just projecting what I have lived in the past. That's right. And um, the change in that in my life has been significant mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. not allowing the pain I walk through to be unfinished and undealt with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It has changed the way I can hope for the future. And That's so absolutely right. I'm just saying I, I have I have been through I have. I'm, I'm a process with this and I've yeah. seen it in certain areas of my life yeah. uh, with the help of you for sure. I was listening to a podcast the other day and it was about um, Tim Keller, who we recently passed away this past year mm -hmm. and they were replaying some of his interviews hmm. and he was talking about when him and Kathy either first got the diagnosis of his cancer or got word that it just was not going to be curable. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about some of their conversations and he said that they kind of got to a point where they said, did, did Jesus die? And did he rise again? And is he coming back? Then everything's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And that was profound for me. And I I've held on to that for a lot of ways. And you say, if you say in your book, something that made me think about that, you say, if we are securely attached to Jesus, then mm -hmm. ultimately we live in a safe world. Right. And what both you and Keller are saying is if we truly believe the truths of the gospel, mm -hmm. then ultimately, in his words, everything will be okay. In your words, ultimately, we live in a safe world. Can mm -hmm. you talk about that? Yeah. Well, it's uh, I, I, I am just so... Um... Uh, anymore, there's very little that I think about or talk about or write about that doesn't have its um, uh, origin in the first six chapters of Genesis. And as as our friends Tim Mackey uh, and others at the Bible Project would say, everything you need to know about human beings, mm. you can find in the first six chapters of Genesis. It tells you everything you need to know. And I think we often we we miss the um, the depth and breadth of the degree to which we have been made in God's image, mm. uh, because one of the ways uh, in in which we have been made in God's image is that we are made male and female, which means for me to be God's image bearer, I I can only do that with females. Like I, I, I can't, I, I can't just like have my, it's just going to be me. It's just going to be me. Mm -hmm. I have to like, I have to be with other people who are not like me in this case, women, but also others of other ethnicities. Other, like I, right. So that's, that's the, I, and that this notion of safety, uh, we believe in a Holy Trinitarian God that is comfortable and confident in himself this this relational God because they are connected relationally. And safety then is about the awareness of others' presence and love for me. That's what safety ultimately hinges on. And so then, what, oh, what do you know? Then human beings have children. And children, in order for them to grow up feeling comfortable and confident in their skin, they have to be securely attached. And secure attachment is the ultimate measurement of safety. You can have kids who are in secure attachment, securely attached relationships, and they're running through the kitchen, they slip and fall, and they cut their head on the kitchen counter. Like, is that safe or not? It's like, well, that's not safe. Well, it, that's, of course they're safe. They're running too fast through the kitchen. Right? We, we'll, we'll find all kinds of ways. Like, I, I've lost three brothers to cancer. Is that a safe world or not? Hmm. And it might be it's like, no, it's not a, it's not a safe, because I, I think of safety as like the absence of any difficulty, the absence of any pain, the absence, like it's, I'm only safe. I mean, this is part of like the kind of the misappropriation of the use of that word even anymore now, right? Yeah. I don't feel safe, which means I don't take any risks. I don't, I, life has to be exactly how I want it, where I want it, how I want it. And, uh, when we are deeply connected and when I know that someone like, I want to know that when we're done here with our, with our podcast recording, 
I want to know that there will be a part of me that will uh, stay with you in 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 the small um, room, in your heart, of, in the heart, in the house of your heart, that uh, uh, in which I get to take up residence. Like I'd like to know that. And if I know that, like that does a world of good for me mm. to know that I'm in, like I don't, you know, not not you know, just a little bit, right? Just a little. And when we have relationships in which we are aware that we have been invited in to take up residence in them and they're going to take us with them. They're going to hold like, Oh, you're going to be, you're, you, I have the room in the house of my heart that has Jamie's name right outside of it. Th this becomes like literally not just metaphorically, not just in some abstract notion, but this becomes like I take you with me when we do this work in these confessional communities. Like you, you, like you take the others with you, mm -hmm. um, and this then becomes like when we say we live in a safe world. I live in a world in which I am loved, and I feel it in my chest. I know it. I, I don't just know it as one plus one is two, and so I can have cancer and be okay because the gospel that Jesus has died is raised, is ascended, is coming, is made real to me because of the people that are part of his body that are in the room that persuade me of this. They're not persuading me of an abstraction. They are the gospel. They are Jesus to me. I can believe in the Jesus of the gospel because I believe in Jamie Ivey. And there's no other way. And this is, I mean, the, the God, I mean, the, the, this is about what it means to bear God's image. Yeah. Like, this, it's not like, oh, there's God, there's us, and then there's the gospel. Yeah. We are his image. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, it's it's striking that, that Tim and Kathy can have that conversation and, and they can be persuaded. And, and like, but it's no small part that they're having a conversation between the two of them. Right. That's not the same thing as just Tim laying in bed by himself and having these ideas in his head. Yeah, right. It's almost like I, I sometimes need this is what I've always said. I need people around me to remind me of what is true. And that's exactly uh -huh. what you're saying. Like I, I need when I can't remember the gospel, like. I need you to remind me of the truth. And that is what you're saying. Well, yeah. And yes, that is, that is what I'm saying. And I am saying that when you and I are having this conversation, I'm saying it's not just that you, Jamie, are reminding me, Kurt, of the gospel that is a third party in the room. I'm saying that the spirit of God who dwells in you is the one who speaks. Mm. And in that way, you are the gospel to me. Like you, like we become so in love with Jesus. The King is so much part of who we are. that There comes a point where I can't tell the difference between you and him. And it doesn't matter. And when he comes, we'll all have a sense that who I see in his fullness, I've already seen this coming because I saw it on the podcast with Jamie. And he'll say, yep, you did. No wonder, because she belongs to me and she has my resemblance. Because, oh. you know, siblings look alike. Uh -huh. She has my resemblance. And there was that Thursday where there was a part of you that really needed to hear me talking. And so she did. You heard me. Mm. 
that's encouraging. And that to be a part of this conversation feels hopeful. Yeah. Well, I think, I think this is what I mean when I say we have conversations that are this real. Yeah. And these become the things that we remember. Mm. And if this is what I pay attention to, and I practice remembering this, this becomes the fundamental ingredients of how we form hope. Mm. Hope is formed out of moments like this. Mm. It's not like, again, it's not some abstract idea. Oh, I hope in this thing called the resurrection. I mean, that's not untrue, but like the resurrection is not first an idea. It is first a real thing that happens in real history with some dude's real body that is like now, like nothing we've ever seen before or since. Mm -hmm. And that, and, and, and we have a taste of that right here. Over the airways. It's amazing to me to think that God would allow us to be a part of other people's forming hope. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I'm just sitting here going like, what an honor. Yeah. Like what a privilege. And it yeah. also makes me think like, when we sit, like, I'll say this. I just had a conversation on the way to work today with a friend who's going through something really, really terrible. I didn't have any answers for her, but she's going through something really terrible. And now mm. after our conversation that I'm having with you, I'm thinking, was I a part of her hope? Mm. Was I a part of her suffering and helping her? how she's reacting to her suffering, then developing hope. Like, is that conversation we had today helping her have future hope? And it just is like, God, thank you. Like, what an honor. Right. Like, I don't deserve that. I don't deserve right. to be a part of that. And yet you let me be a part of that friend's story today. Yeah. I mean, I, I think this again is like part of how we, I often say, uh, God takes us far more seriously than we do. Mm. And, and, and like the whole thing of like, no, you're going to be my image bearers, which means you're not just going to like, look like me, like the photograph or the, you know, sentience or intelligence. It's if I'm a healer, then you're going to be a healer. If I'm going to be the bringer of hope by virtue of my presence, then you're going to be the bringer of hope by virtue of your presence. This is how it works. Like we can't escape the reality that we are made in his image. And so everything that he would do with intentionality relationally, we are destined to be that kind of living being. Mm. And, and we don't take ourselves that serious. You're no, right. No. 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 And, I, and I think evil does not want us to be aware of this. Yeah. Evil. And so therefore it's easier, it's safer for us to think, well, hope is a thing that I'm either going to hope, hopefully like get some of that yeah. or uh -huh. maybe not. It's going to happen to me, let alone that somehow I would be uh, an important part of helping others construct form hope mm. that I am the hope mm. Mm. by virtue of presence, because I like I'm like I convey the Holy Spirit, like the Holy Spirit is coming through me. Mm. Tim Mackey says, once you get past the first two pages of the Bible, we discover that there's virtually nothing that God does through the rest of the Bible that does not directly require and involve the actions of human beings. Mm. Not small. My and again, he he like yeah. So, uh, you know that that Jesus wants us to be he, mm. that he's not just saving us. When he says to, to Peter, like I want to make you fishers of men. Like yeah. I, I want I I I want like I'm forming a team, and the team is going to be an right. extension of me. Like 
y'all like we're all part of the, the mission mm-hmm. because you are from the beginning. You were intended to be my representatives on the earth on the, on the first page of the Bible. Mm. And that means that everything that I'm going to do that I would do on the earth, I want you to do on the earth. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it takes, it takes work to do this. It takes, it takes a lot of effort to like Mm -hmm. take off all the garments of my shame and my fear and all, and, and, and particular theologies and so forth and so on that, uh, you know, that, that evil has kind of hijacked and allow myself to believe that my, in my vulnerability, uh, I allow, I, I, I submit myself to God for God to use me to become his presence of hope mm. that's going to form in other people. And in so doing, like, I'm going to do the same thing. Like I'm going to form hope. We're going to form it. We're going to make it. Yeah. Right. Which is important because then it's not like we, we begin to recognize like, oh, it is a thing that I actually have agency to do something to form. It's not just going to be this capricious thing that maybe it'll happen for me. Maybe it won't happen for me. That's encouraging. Yeah. That's yeah. super encouraging. Yeah. Especially if someone's listening and that's a lot of us in the middle of pain, in the middle of suffering that we have. Through the work of the spirit, we have the ability to form hope. Right. It's good. Yeah. It's good news. Yeah. It's really good news. Yeah. Kurt, I cannot wait for people to get this book. I've read all of your books. This is the new one called The Deepest Place. Uh, can you say the tagline again? Suffering, Suffering and, the, and formation the formation of, of hope. hope. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So very good. You guys, this book comes out August 29th. Uh, Kurt, thank you for your time today. Jamie, oh, man, thank you. It's a pleasure always. And I, I am really hopeful for next week. <laughs> me too i'm very hopeful for next week as well and i'm gonna go read john 11 every day until then since you gave me a little sneak peek into what will be happening um i would like to ask you this before we go what are you reading these days oh well uh a new piece of fiction that i picked up from my wife called uh, i i i've just started it like two nights ago i can't remember and she's read it she loved it from my, it's called the humans okay uh it's a british author uh huh. And I, I can't. And I'm, 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 you know, twenty pages in. So I, I'll, okay. I just know. Yeah. So I'm reading the humans. I'm reading the second time through. I'm reading this book called Dominion. You've probably heard me talk about this by Tom. You, Holland. you have told me about it. Yeah. I'm reading it through the second time. It's just, yeah. It's really, it's really rich. Uh, and then I'm, I'm Tom doing, Holland, the historian, not Spider Man. Okay, so I was in poor Bro- Tom Holland. I was I was in I was in Brooklyn. I was in I was in Brooklyn preaching back in May, and <laughs> I'm like, and I and I, and I mention and I say like, because I think they asked me like, well, what what do you think? We're we're talking about crucifixion. I say, well, uh, you know, there's the work of Tom Holland, and I start to go down <laughs> this path, and like the 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 pastor, like Rich Velotas, he stops me and he says like, just so you know, Kurt, I think just. <laughs> We're probably not talking about the Tom Holland that you're talking. You're very, 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 and I'm like, I like, and I like, I don't even know this. I don't like it. And then he said, like, who's from Brooklyn? Apparently, Tom Holland is from Brooklyn, which is okay. So yeah, no, not that Tom Holland. Yeah. Um, and then I'm reading this book on prayer. Uh, uh, there's there's this Catholic uh, in in the in the previous book that I wrote. This Catholic theologian uh, Hans Urs von Balthasar. Um, uh, now deceased, but many would consider him to be one of the most important Catholic theologians of the 20th century. Um, mm-hmm. And he, he wrote a book. It's called Prayer. That's what it's called. And it, I, like, I'm I'm just sitting, kind of, uh, uh, kind of basting in this, reading it very, very slowly. I'm probably 15 pages in, and like, because I'm reading it like uh, two pages every four days. Yeah. Just sitting with stuff on prayer, and um, mm. so that's that's what I'm reading. I love it so much. Um, Kurt, I am the lucky one who gets to see you next week. Mm -hmm. And so I'm excited about our time together. And I'm going to put a link in the show notes. Your latest podcast series has been on confessional community and Mm -hmm. I've enjoyed it. And I think that would be a good thing for people to listen to if you're curious of what is confessional community and what is this thing that we do that anyone can do. Um, And so I'm going to share that with people as well. Great. Great. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much, Kurt, and I'll see you next week. Very good. Thank you. 
Hey friends, I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. If you want more conversations just like that from my podcast, The Happy Hour, check out these links over here. We're gonna have more shows for you. And to make sure that you never miss any of our conversations, go ahead and subscribe. I don't know what you're waiting on. Thanks for watching.